Hi, today we are going to design one of the most popular websites among developers, Stack Overflow. You might think that it's just a simple questions and answers platform, but it has many interesting features that we will explore today. Let's dive in. First, let's discuss the structure of the design. It consists of four main parts introduction, architecture, domain specific topics, and details. In the introduction, we prepare information for the design, find references, ask clarifying questions to the interviewer, and based on this, construct functional and non functional requirements. In the architecture section, we will talk about high-level architecture, data model, and discuss core technologies of our website, such as technologies for real-time updates. Next, we delve into specific topics related to our website. This category includes things like search, text editor, and others. And finally, we discuss topics relevant for most web applications, such as security, performance, accessibility, and others. Let's start with the references. As an example, we can use Stack Overflow. Generally, any questions and answer sites such as Quora can serve as a good example. What distinguishes Stack Overflow from other sites is its focus on code. Before we begin, we need to gather more information about the application. Let's consider what we can ask the interviewer. Sites like Stack Overflow include many features. Which ones should be focused on? I suggest feed, post creation, post search and likes. What do you think? Sounds good to me. The user should also be able to subscribe to interesting posts and be notified of updates to them. How should they receive notifications? It depends on the user's preference. It could be through a browser notification or an email. We also show notifications on the page if the user is on the site. What about offline features? Do we need to support offline mode? No, there is no need for that. Do we have plans to launch a mobile application or should we invest time in developing a mobile version of the page? There is no mobile app currently. The site should work on all devices. Do we need at least two different roles on the site, a normal user and a moderator? Should we provide some additional functions for moderators? Yes, but let's leave that out of scope for now. We should add a text editor for the site. What should it support besides basic formatting features? Can users attach files to posts? Support for code blocks and images will be sufficient. Users cannot attach files to posts. What should be in the feed? Latest posts or most popular posts? Defaults to recent posts. But other sorting options are supported, such as by popularity and activity. We don't just ask questions. We offer our vision for the product. Before asking questions, you should envision what the app should be and ask a question to confirm if the interviewer agrees with your direction. It is fine if you don't agree with something as long as you can defend your vision. Also remember that you can't cover all possible features of the application. That's why it's crucial to focus on the most interesting and challenging parts. Your goal is to demonstrate your strength to the interviewers. We will discuss many things today, but you shouldn't and mustn't include all of them in a real interview, because there is a high chance that you just won't have enough time. However, we still discuss all these things, because I don't know how a real interview may unfold, so it would be good to be prepared for the widest possible range of topics. Okay, now we're ready to collect requirements. Let's start with the functional requirements. Again, what's the difference between functional and non-functional requirements? Usually, you can use a role. 
functional requirements include what the application must do and non-functional requirements describe how the application should work. For example, having a search is a functional requirement, but making such a search work fast as a non-functional characteristic. Functional requirements are feed. The feed is shown when the user opens the website. It supports different sorting options. Search. Users can search posts. It is also supports different search parameters. Creating posts. Users can ask questions. Comments. Users can answer and comment questions. And votes. Users can like or dislike questions and answers. Next, let's look at non-functional requirements. The first one is a real-time update. Sometimes real-time updates might be categorized as a functional requirement. For example, in a chat application, it might be a functional requirement because it's a core feature of the application. In our case, lifetime updates are important but not critical for our application. Adaptation for different devices. The website should work seamlessly on different devices with varying screen sizes. Performance. The application must work fast and smoothly. Accessibility. The website must be accessible to people with different disabilities. Security. We should consider potential security vulnerabilities. And localization. The website must support different languages. Having discussed the requirements, we are now ready to begin. First, we will talk about high-level design. We need to determine the core building blocks for our application. For architecture, we will use the MVC pattern or Model View Controller. MVC is a robust pattern which is, in my opinion, is good for describing a typical web application or website. For real-time updates, we will use WebSockets. We will discuss later why we prefer the solution more than others. For serving static files, we will use CDNs to deliver static files faster to end users. And for storing data, we will use a relational DB because entities in our data model are closely coupled with each other. We will also discuss this later in the data model section. Let's look closer at each segment of the architecture. The first one is the view. The view is the layer responsible for displaying the user interface. It consists of three components. Feed page responsible for showing the feed. The feed may include the most popular or newest posts. It is the page that is open by default. Post page is responsible for displaying a post, questions and answers. And new posts page. This page is for editing and creating posts. It includes a text editor, which we will discuss later. The controller is the core of our application responsible for handling business logic. Generally, we can divide all the controller's responsibilities into three main categories. Handling user events such as clicks, keyboard events, etc. Saving and polling post drafts and updating data in real time. We will discuss later which data should be updated in real time. Usually, the model is a database, but on the client side, we don't have database, but we have other storages. We have two types of storages on the client side. Client storage for data, which is related only to the client and shouldn't be sent to the server. And client side cache for saving server responses. API model consists of two sub-models. REST API model is responsible for most network operations such as getting posts, creating, deleting, etc. WebSocket model is responsible only for handling WebSocket connections and providing real-time updates. The notification model is responsible for showing notifications. We will discuss later how we realize them. In reality, the backend is much more complex than we display here. However, as this is not a backend system design, we should focus on the frontend part. On the backend, we have 
an observer, which is the core of the backend application. It is responsible for handling client requests, preparing data for the database, querying data from the database, and other things. A web server is responsible for serving static files such as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. CDN is a system of distributed servers around the world. CDNs are needed to deliver static files to users faster. There are two types of storages on the backend side, relational database and file storage. File storage is needed for saving files, for example, images. The relational database is responsible for saving application data. The next question is how we will render our application. There are two main approaches, client-side rendering and server-side rendering. Each has its pros and cons. Client-side rendering is easy to develop and maintain, provides smooth transitions between pages. However, it has bad SEO, bad first contentful paint metric, and bad time to interactive metrics. From the other side, server-side rendering provides good SEO, time to interactive is equal first contentful paint metrics, However, it also gives us slow transitions between pages and it's harder to develop and maintain. Before we choose one of the approaches, let's consider what is important to us. We need fast initial loading, quick loading when using this side, and good is EO. Server-side rendering is very traditional approach for such websites. However, it is a complex solution which leads to iteration and increased load on our servers. Let's try to break the rules and see how we can implement client-side rendering in our case and whether it might be better than using server-side rendering. The first requirement is fast initial loading. Is loading with server-side rendering much faster than client-side rendering? Usually yes. The main problem with client-side rendering is the blank page problem. It happens because it takes a lot of time to render the app on the client side rather than doing it on the server side and delivering rendered HTML to the client. However, we can improve the situation by splitting the bundle into chunks. We don't need to render all pages of the application. Instead, we will render only parts that are needed for the current page. In our case, it would be three chunks. Feed page, posts page, and creating posts page. Splitting into chunks can help us solve the problem of long initial loadings. Other chunks may be loaded lazily in the background or on demand. The next point is fast loading time when using this side. We don't need to do anything special here because SPA and client-side rendering provide smooth transitions between pages as we don't need to request rendering of the page from the server each time. SEO is the most problematic area for SPA applications. We can do several things to make it better. We can use proper titles and meta tags for pages. We can generate a sitemap and create open graph tags. However, this does not completely solve the problem. To achieve as good results as server-side rendering, we have to use the pre-rendering approach. What is pre-rendering? Pre-rendering is a technique where we return two different versions of the page, one for web crawlers and one for real users. A web crawler is a robot whose goal is to crawl the internet for websites. They assess different parameters such as initial loading and based on these parameters, set rating for a site. The problem is some crawlers may not wait until a page is rendered. So we can use two different versions of the page, one for real users and one for web crawlers. For web crawlers, we will send a page pre-rendered on the server, which gives us good SEO. For real users, we will send a usual SPA with client-side rendering approach, which provides fast initial loading and smooth transitions within the app. 
Let's look at the whole picture. Client-side rendering plus pre-rendering gives us easy of development. Client-side rendering is more familiar to most front-end developers. Fast transitions between pages, as we have mentioned many times earlier, and good SEO is provided by the pre-rendering technique. At the same time, what problems do we have? It's higher complexity. Pre-rendering pages for web crawlers and logic for handling such logic requires additional resources to implement and maintain. Performance can be worse on low-performance devices. We shift the rendering load from the server to the client, which may be resource demanding. And we have to maintain pre-rendered copies of each page, which requires storage and space. However, space is relatively cheaper than computing resources. Based on these points, we can conclude that client-side rendering and pre-rendering can offer some advantages over server-side rendering, the most important being the ease of development and decreased loads on the servers. Let's look on the screen and try to understand how the data model for our application may look. Post. This is the main entity. A post is a question that user publish on the site. It includes fields such as the author of the post, tags, comments, and a list of users who have liked or disliked the post. User. Each user has a role which could be a normal user or an administrator or moderator. We maintain a list of posts they have liked and disliked. Additionally, we include an information field for adding extra information like links to social networks. Tag. This includes the tag name and a list of posts associated with that tag. And comment. This is a comment on a post which can also be an answer if the topic starter has marked it. Users can like and dislike comments. Next, let's consider potential scenarios for retrieving different sets of data. The first one is getting fit. We query data from the posts table, which retrieves data from other tables through relationships. Second scenario, getting all users' questions. Here, the user is the main entity. Fortunately, within the user's entity, we have links to all the user's posts. Although not all possible relationships are shown here, the strategy remains the same. Posts retrieve data from related tags and comments tables. And the last one, getting all questions by tag. Each tag entity contains links to all questions associated with that tag. Let's integrate the data retrieval flow with a high-level architecture to understand how it applies to the actual application. The feed page requests data. Controller handles the request and calls the API model. The API model sends a request to the server. The server makes a request to the database. The database selects data from the feed. The server sends data to the client. The API model receives the data and saves it to the client's cache. The controller retrieves data from the cache. And finally, the controller prepares the data for the view and send it. Now the view can display data to the user. The next topic is pagination. As with any site handling and displaying large amounts of data, our site should implement pagination in some form. The idea of any type of pagination is to show data in portions to make loadings faster and save the user's traffic. We have two main types of pagination, offset-based pagination and cursor-based pagination. In our case, the situation is quite interesting because we will implement both. For the post feed, we will use cursor-based pagination. The infinity list model is more natural for feeds since users usually don't care about the exact number of posts in a feed and prefer not to jump to a specific page. For the comment section and search results, offset-based pagination is more appropriate. Users often want to jump to a specific page in these cases. Offset-based pagination is effective, but it has a problem. 
as the number of rows to skip increases, performance deteriorates. Let's compare two different queries. With offset-based pagination, the duration is 0.4 seconds. With cursor-based pagination, the duration is only 0.0002 seconds. The difference in performance is significant. If we still need to use offset-based pagination, how can we improve its speed? We can employ a deferred join technique. Let's look on two different SQL queries that accomplish the same task but at different speeds. A query with a deferred join is much faster and you can verify it through your own measurements. So how does deferred join works? The concept is to query only the IDS instead of all the data, which can be a performance bottleneck. We specify that the IDS in the inner join or subset and the main table are the same columns. The next topic is API endpoints. We will not describe all API endpoints as it's not recommending during an interview. However, we'll just look at some of them to provide a basic vision of how we should construct them. Additionally, the interviewer may ask us to describe these to understand our approach to designing API endpoints. Just for your information, we will use plus and minus signs to indicate the order of sorting for posts. Let's look at two cases related to working with the API. The first case is a user interface case. What happens if the number of votes for a post is too large? A bad solution is to display the number of votes as is, leading to a disorganized page layout. A better approach is to use abbreviated names for a large numbers, such as K4000 and KK4 millions, and etc. The next case is a network case. Consider a scenario where a user accesses the website on two different devices, for instance a mobile phone and a desktop. First, the user clicks on the vote button. The frontend sends a request to the server. The server then changes the number of votes on the post and updates the database. Next, the user attempts to upload again from the desktop. If we are not using web sockets for real-time updates or they just don't work for some reasons, the frontend does not update the interface, allowing the user to upload again. A request is then sent to the server. The server must be prepared for such scenarios and refuse the operation. An error message from the server is received on the front-end side, prompting an error notification for the user. Another topic we must discuss regarding API design is API versioning. Why do we need versions for an API? Imagine using an API on the front-end. The back-end team decides to deploy new API endpoints incompatible with the old API. This means all front-end teams using the API must migrate to the new API immediately to keep the web application workable. To avoid this, we can use different versions of the API. Is API versioning necessary in our case? Yes, I think. Especially if our API could change in the future, which is quite possible. If we introduce major changes that break Backward compatibility users will not need to migrate immediately. Conversely, users needing new features as soon as possible can upgrade immediately. Thus, API versioning is a safer solution. And the next question, where should we pass the version? There are two methods using the URL or passing the version inside the HTTP header. Developers typically use the version number in the URL for API versioning. However, we can improve this by adding the version in the HTTP header. 
This approach allows us to maintain the correct semantic of the URL and it makes the URL shorter. The final topic in the architecture section is real-time updates. In our case, we need to update data in multiple locations. New posts added to the feed, new comments added to our post, votes on our post and new comments for questions to which we are subscribed. We have already decided to use WebSockets, but it's important to understand why. What options do we have? We can use short polling, long polling, server-side events or WebSockets. Let's start with a short polling. Technically, short polling isn't a technology, it's just a pattern. It's a simply periodically asking the server for updates. We could do this, for example, every 5 seconds. Short polling is easy to implement, which is its main advantage. However, the downside is obvious. There is a risk that most requests will be unnecessary and we will not receive updates immediately if they occur at the start of a new interval between two requests. This option is unsuitable for us. Updates may occur infrequently and sending requests every 5 seconds is an inefficient use of resources. The next one is long polling. Long polling involves sending a request to the server and not receiving a response until updates are needed. Long polling is more suitable for our needs than short polling. It offers near real-time updates and minimizes unnecessary server requests. However, updates may not be in real-time. For instance, if two updates occur simultaneously, the server handles the first update, sends it to the client and then the connection closes. Reestablishing the connection takes time. We also need to consider updating data in different locations. Should we open a connection for every location where we update information in real time? And my answer is no, this approach is not scalable. We should open one connection and reuse it, adding an event type field to differentiate updates. While long polling is a viable solution, it's far from perfect. The next one is server-side events. Server-side events work similarly to long polling, but without additional work on our part. We simply trigger the event on the server side and listen for it on the client side. Server-side events run over HTTP and provide an event-driven interaction model familiar to front-end developers, making implementation and debugging easier. It have smaller HTTP overhead compared to polling methods, 8 bytes versus 5 bytes in average. They support different event types, eliminating the need for event type field, and also allow using a single channel for updates in multiple locations. However, they also have some drawbacks. Require a constant connection and support only 6 parallel browser connections. For more connections, we need HTTP version 2 or higher. And the last option is WebSocket. WebSocket is a bi-directional channel allowing communication in both directions, client-server and server-client. While server-side events is a good solution, we prefer to use WebSockets for following reasons. Better browser support, for example, Internet Explorer 11 supports WebSockets but not server-side events. It's more familiar to developers due to widespread use. It supports bidirectional and binary data transmitting, offering flexibility for future needs. We could use regular HTTP for server responses, but that would introduce HTTP overhead and additional complexity. And also, WebSockets has a built-in browser dev tools. Considering these factors, WebSockets are the best choice 
despite their complexity, which can be managed with libraries like Socket I.O. Whether you choose server-side events or long polling, both are valid solutions. However, be prepared to justify your choice during an interview. Let's look at scenarios where we receive data in real time. When a new post is added, we render a notification at the top of the page. When a post receives a new vote, we simply update the number. And when a user receives a new comment on their post or subscription, we display a small red mark near the message icon. Now let's discuss the main specific aspects. We will start with search. Search is a crucial feature for questions and answer sites. Simple search by post title isn't very effective. We need more flexibility. We will integrate a search template into the search input. For example, to find all questions written by the user John Doe, you can type these in the search input. Anything within square brackets will be interpreted on the server as a k-value pair. If it's a valid entity name, the server will return query results filtered by such an entity or multiple entities. This approach is initially more challenging to start using. However, once familiar with the pattern, it becomes much faster than traditional UI search. Considering our main audience is programmers, this method suits us well. We should also include a tips panel to guide users on how to use the search. Next, a text editor. A text editor is essential for creating and editing posts. What features should it support? Basic formatting operations like bold, italic and underline, code blocks, lists, links and images. Regarding text format, we have several options. HTML, Markdown and Common Mark. The first one is HTML. Using HTML elements is a common approach in many text editors. The simplest method is to use the content editable element and exec command. However, exec command is officially deprecated and no direct alternative exists yet. Despite this, this approach is still in use, though not recommended. Advantages of this approach, it's easy to implement without additional parsers, it eliminates the need for a preview mode, and it's flexible with rich functionality. However, it has lack of standard implementation method. Exec command is deprecated and content editable behavior may vary across browsers and devices. Challenging to develop and maintain due to increased complexity and potential issues. Teams often use third-party text editor solutions rather than building from scratch due to resource demands. We also eliminate the need for a preview mode when using HTML elements in the text editor. The next popular option is Markdown. Markdown is a popular format among developers for its simplicity and focus on text editing. It's easy to develop and maintain, it's human-readable, facilitating easy reading and writing, it's portable across many platforms. Users can edit text in another editor and then post it into our editor. It's familiar to the developer community. However, it has a learning curve since we have to understand syntax, it requires a preview mode, as text must be converted to HTML for display, and it's limited in creating complex layouts and flexible formatting. Markdown is suitable if it meets our requirements. However, it's not ideal for our audiences. It works well for developer-centric sites like GitHub or Stack Overflow, but is less suitable for general audience as in Quora. The next option is Common Mark. Common Mark is a standardized version of Markdown that addresses some of Markdown's issues and slightly different syntax. Standardization reduces ambiguity and ensures consistent parsing. Compatible with existing Markdown parsers, 
and also it allows for custom syntax extensions adding to its extensibility. However, it also inherits Markdown's limitations. It introduces additional complexity as it's not as widely recognized as Markdown. We're not limited to these options. We can also consider LaTeX, Restructured Text, Textile and others. For our project, we will use CommonMark because it's familiar to developers. It's user-friendly for reading, writing and transforming into HTML and other formats and it's advanced version of Markdown. It also used in major projects like GitHub, GitLab, Reddit, Stack Overflow and others. Using common mark necessitates additional steps such as adding a preview mode. Let's explore the full workflow of using the text editor. First, the user edits text using common mark. Next, we convert common mark text to HTML using a third party parser and display a preview of the question in HTML. Next, once the user completes editing, they click the button to publish it. The controller handles the publish event and sends a request to the REST model, which then forward the data to the server. The server validates and sanitizes the user's common mark data before storing it in the database storage. We will delve into the topic of sanitizing later. Users should also be able to add images to posts. We could integrate a button to facilitate adding images into the Markdown template. However, a key consideration is where to store these images. We have two options, storing on our servers or using third-party image hosting like imgear. If we will store images on our servers, it gives us more control over storage and maximum flexibility. Using our own servers gives us more confidence that the image will not be deleted or corrupted. However, it also brings more difficult to implement and maintain. If we will use third-party image hosting, the image hosts take full responsibility for storing and delivering the images. However, we has less control leads to less flexibility. We cannot customize the settings and must use the image hosting as is. Before choosing an option, we need to consider our priorities. Our users are not expected to upload a large volume of images. A small site's content is text-based. However, images may be added to post for clarity. There is no need for image processing, like adding filters or cropping. The primary requirement is for images to be appropriately sized for the user's device. Based on these requirements, using an image hosting service is more practical, requiring less maintenance on our part. Economic factors should also be included in the final decision. The next topic is drafts. Drafts are an important feature of the text editor. When editing a post, losing text is highly undesirable, which can occur due to power outages, accidentally closed tabs, or simply needing to pause and resume later. The strategy is to save drafts periodically. Continuously saving after every action would overload our servers, so the ideal interval is between 10 and 60 seconds. This frequency reduces the risk of losing significant amounts of text. We also compare the current draft with the previous version and if they are identical, we avoid setting a save request. This approach conserves resources and avoids unnecessary server requests. We choose to store drafts on the server rather than in local storage. But look at the both options. If we will use local storage, it's easy to implement. However, drafts will not be shared across devices. For databases, data can be shared across devices and users cannot accidentally lose data. However, it's difficult to implement and maintain and we need eviction strategy. 
We will use database storage as more robust solution that allows us to share drafts between devices. We will keep drafts for one week. This is not a blocking platform where a pause can be very long, but creating a pause may require some research and time. We previously discussed using WebSockets for real-time updates. These can be integrated with notifications to promptly inform users of significant events. Displaying notifications where the user is on the site is straightforward. We can render a notification pop-up on the page. However, showing notification when the page is closed poses a challenge. Firstly, we must identify which data on the page requires real-time updates. This could include new comments added to the user's question and new comments added to an issue the user is subscribed to. Users may also prefer alternative notification methods such as email. Moreover, they should have the option to disable all notifications. Now let's review the complete schema for notifications. We are using Push API integrated in browsers that support it. To obtain permissions to display notifications and acquire the Push subscription object, which will be crucial later. Next, we request permission from the user to show notifications. The Push subscription object is sent to the server. The server stores this push subscription object in the database, which we will use later for sending out notifications. Whenever an entity is updated, a request is sent to the web push service. This service, often a third-party model, prepares requests for the notification API. The web push service then forwards the request to the notification API. We handle the push event through a service worker. It's essential to have the service worker registered as it needs to listen for new push events continuously, even when the web page is closed. Upon receiving a message via the service worker, we display it to the user. Clicking on this message opens a page with the updated content. The service worker is crucial for handling server updates when page is closed as it operates in the background. While notifications can be beneficial, we must use them very carefully to avoid annoyance. Some users might not want to receive notifications even if they are subscribed to a topic. We should offer an option to disable notifications in the user settings. Alternatively, users can opt to receive notifications via email. There may be users who prefer not to receive notifications from any source and simply wish to check a list of a subscribed questions in their profile. It is important to not overuse notifications. We should reserve them for critical information and always allow users the option to disable them at all. In the details section, we will take a closer look at specific aspects of the application. The first one is security. Security is very important, especially since we are dealing with user input, which can be a source of many vulnerabilities, for example, XSS or cross-site scripting attacks. The main thing we should stick to is to not trust user input. There are two potential places where malicious code can be executed on the server, it might be SQL injection attack, and XSS attack on the user's page. Preview mode and the display of questions and answers are areas vulnerable to XSS attacks. First, we need to sanitize user input for preview mode. Here's how we can do it. In preview mode, executing code should be prohibited. This means that before placing any code as HTML on the page, we must sanitize it. HTML sanitization involves examining and creating a new HTML document that only includes safe and desired tags and attributes. It means that we need additional steps before adding content to the page. The text editor contains raw content that might be malicious. The converter within the editor performs two tasks. 
convert command mark to HTML and sanitize the HTML. And finally, we insert the sanitized HTML into the preview. We also have to decide how to store data in the database. We have three options. We can convert common mark to HTML and store only the HTML. This approach is bad as we lose the original data needed for text editing. Convert common mark to HTML and store both the original common mark and the parsed HTML. We can store both of them. This is a better solution. Store only the raw common data converting it to the HTML just before showing it to the client, eliminating the need to store HTML. We will later determine the best approach for our case. Additional question is when to sanitize the data. Sanitizing on the client side may lead to security risks as browsers can be compromised. Therefore, it's safer to perform sanitization on the server side. Let's look at the schema for this process. First, we send the raw common mark content to the server. Next, the server stores the common mark content in the database as is. Before sending text content to the client, the server parses the common mark to HTML and sanitizes it. The server then sends the sanitized HTML to the client, which displays it on the page. A problem with this approach is resource consumption during frequent reads. Each time a post is requested, it needs to be parsed into HTML and sanitized. If a post is read million of times, this could lead to performance issues. To fix this, we will parse and sanitize once, then store both the raw common mark and the sanitized HTML in the database. This method saves resources by parsing the markdown format only once. However, it does increase space requirements since we store data in both formats. There is also a security concern about storing potentially malicious HTML in the database. Let's revisit the schema, this time applying our new approach. We continue to send raw common mark content to the server just as before. The server then parses the common mark into HTML and sanitizes it before saving in the database. We save both the raw common mark and the HTML version in the database. When a client requests a post, we send the HTML version from the database. We retain the raw common mark in the database for potential editing. The sanitized HTML is then sent to the client, who displays the text content on the page. Moving sanitization to the server introduces a potential security issue. When sanitizing HTML just before displaying it on the page, we achieve maximum security. However, doing this on the client side isn't as secure. We could add sanitizing on the client side as a additional layer of security. We also have to protect data in transition. We will use the HTTPS protocol to protect data in transit, which protect us from the man in the middle attack. HTTPS also enhance security for other client-server communications. While the public nature of POST is less of a concern, we have various roles on our side, like moderators and administrators whose data is private. Moreover, using HTTPS improves the site's ranking in Google. Also, it's important to ensure that the chosen CDN supports HTTPS connectivity. To fully protect data, we implement safeguards at every step. On the server, HTML is sanitized after parsing and before being saved to the database. During data transition, we use an encrypted HTTPS connection to protect data in transit. On the client side, before placing HTML on the page, we additionally sanitize it. Here are other essential security measures for our website. We should implement a spam protection system. Users without a verified account can post messages. Messages can be marked as spam by users and if a message receives enough spam marks, for example 5, it will be automatically deleted. 
We also should use the DOS attack protection system, applying rate limiting to control how many requests a user can make in a given time frame. We also should use Content Security Policy, or CSP, to prevent the execution of embedded scripts and script from unreliable sources. And we implement HTTP Strict Transport Security server-side. HSTS HTTP Response Header informs browser that the site should only be accessed via HTTPS, automatically converting all HTTP access attempts to HTTPS. Performance is a crucial aspect for every web application and site. We categorize it into three areas. Network performance, UI performance, and JavaScript and CSS performance. Let's start with the network performance. Our primary goal in network performance is to deliver all the, the data you need as quickly as possible. Achieving this involves placing data as close to the end user as possible, utilizing modern protocols for speedy delivery, and sending only the necessary data. Using CDNs for faster resource delivery to users, choose a CDN with full SSL support and DDoS protection to encrypt traffic from users to the region server, implementing HTTP 2 or higher, which offers advantages over HTTP version 1, such as parallel streaming and header compression, applying data compression techniques, Loading only essential data fields for specific transactions, possibly using query parameters to specify required fields. Using web sockets for smaller messages size and near real time updates, thereby enhancing need for performance. Compressing all images and providing appropriately sized images for different devices and screens. Preloading and deferring data loads. Preload data like the next page of search results and defer non-critical data such as analytic scripts and implementing client-side caching to avoid redundant data requests. Discussing user interface performance involves addressing perceived performance. While we can't literally speed up the site through user interface, we can improve its visual responsiveness. Here's how. We can implement virtualization and pagination, particularly for long lists. We apply pagination for comments and search results and virtualization for the feed, optimizing lazy data loading. We will use skeletons instead of traditional loaders. This doesn't quicken the loading process, but improves the perception of speed. We also use smooth animation for a more visually appealing and smoother user interface experience. We will use lightweight fonts or SVG icons for icons and buttons. And also we will limit the use of custom fonts, minimize the number of font choices and weights. I have combined JavaScript and CSS into one category since improvements in both can be achieved at the code level. For JavaScript, we can minimize the use of JavaScript animations, shift heavy computations from the client to the web workers or to the server side, reduce operations on DOM elements, which are resource intensive, and split the bundle into smaller chunks for better load times. For CSS, we prefer CSS-only animations, employ a naming convention like BAM, for better organization and readability, and avoid deep selector nesting. Remember that the first level selector is the most performant. To ensure our website is accessible to people with different disabilities, we follow these guidelines. We employ meaningful alt attributes for images, use appropriate role attributes for HTML elements, Using area label or area labeled by for interactive elements without labels. Implement semantic HTML for better screen reader compatibility. Ensure all elements and text have sufficient contrast ratios for readability and interaction. Use relative size units to make text readable on all screens. And design interactive elements with larger clickable areas than their visual representation. Let's look at some advanced accessibility technique. The first one is go to content pattern. 
involving a visually hidden button for screen readers to bypass repetitive content such as header and navigation. Active element pattern, remembering the last focused element before opening a model and returning focus to it afterward. And screen reader announcement, using area live or role equal alert to inform users about on-page events. Let's talk about the localization. Supporting multiple languages is essential, though we can't cover every language. So our strategy will include supporting English as the default language, prepare this site for translation into other languages, and also we have to separate text content from the code. You can see how we can do this on the screen. First, we need to choose the translation format. First one is I18 Next. It offers flexibility, easy integration with modern web frameworks and good TMS or Translate Management System support. However, it is limited in some advanced formatting features. Get Text provides simplicity and major toolkit, but also limited in advanced features and ICU message format. It supports complex features, but has a steeper learning curve and limited TMS support. The next question is, how will we do translation and cultural adaptation of the text? We also have multiple options. First one is translation agencies. Professional and comprehensive, but costly. Freelance translators, flexible and efficient, but with wearable quality. Internal translation team offers control and consistency but is resource intensive. Crowdsourcing, cost effective but inconsistent in quality. And the last option is machine translation tools. Fast and efficient solution, but often lack quality and require human review. The next question is, how do we manage translations? Again, we have several options. The first one is translation agencies, integrated services with quality control but limited flexibility. Translation management systems, efficient with collaboration tools, though potentially costly. Open source management systems, customizable and usually inexpensive but require technical expertise. And also we can use our own custom solution. It cost effective but require additional resource management. So what do we have? We know that company resources are limited or unknown. We can assume that we don't have an internal translation team. We also know that our website is free and has no payment features. Our website does not include a lot of text content to translate, as most of it is user-generated. Based on these data, we make choices. We will support only English by default. We engage the community for translating into other languages. We will use an open source or proprietary solution for storing translations. We select I18 Next for its readability and easy of use. The last topic is adaptation for different devices. Let's look how we can adapt our website for mobile phones and other devices. The first one is screen size. You should not upload high resolution images on devices with small screens and text should be large enough to be easily read. We also should consider the touch interactions. Hover and focus events are not possible on touch screens. We need to find a different way to highlighting elements. And also, all interactive elements should be large enough to be easily clicked. Content prioritization. We should use CSS meta queries to adapt the user interface for smaller screens, focusing on content over decorative elements. And the last one is performance. We should avoid hard preloading for mobile devices because the traffic on mobile devices is usually limited and we have to be careful with this. To conclude, let's recap our requirements. First one is functional requirements. We have implemented FIP. It supports sorting by different parameters. We can get the newest post, the post with the most votes, etc. We also implemented infinity scrolling to make it fast. User can search by post title, internal content, tag, and username. 
We have additionally implemented pagination for search results. Users can create new posts in the text editor. We also looked at the formats in which text content should be stored and transmitted. We discussed how users can comment on other people's posts. And voting, we discussed the API for voting. Non-functional requirements. We use WebSocket to update new feed posts, votes and comments on our posts and subscriptions in real time. We discussed in details how our text editor should work. We also covered the different text formats and the security issues associated with them. We discussed how to adapt the website for different devices and screens to ensure a smooth experience everywhere. We discussed improving performance from three different perspectives – the network performance, user interface performance and the code. We designed the website to be accessible to users with various disabilities. We discussed possible security issues associated with user-generated content-oriented websites. We decided that we would use English as the default language and choose a particular approach and format for translating the website that was most optimal in our case. That's all for today. I will include some useful links below. If you found this video useful, please don't forget to click the like button and subscribe to the channel. Stay tuned for more upcoming videos. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.